So I want to introduce to you my friend, a man that is teaching the fatherless about God the Father and the importance of being pastored and coached throughout the world. And he, God has got favor on him. He's got increase on him. Would you please welcome my friend, Brian Greenwood. Well, one thing I've learned <clears throat> is that um, Jeff's going to preach everything I have to say, so I'm just going <laughs> to say a couple things, sit down, and we're good to go. Now, I've learned one thing, is that everybody's doing one of three things. They're either running from, running to, or trying to get away from their father. Excuse me, they're running from, running to, or trying to be like, and trying to disengage or trying to... Um, find a way to deal with the fatherless issue in their life. And it doesn't matter if you come from a good home. So today as we talk about the F word to some people, because <clears throat> it is, it, it is to some people, it's a word that we don't want to hear about. But to other people, it's something that does, have, they have had something good, but there's been a disconnect. I had a good dad. But something's disconnected because the one thing I really wanted from my dad was to show me the way. And in a lot of areas he did, but a lot of areas he just didn't know how. And so it's easy to sit back and look and say, well, if I had this better, then this would have happened. If I would have had this better, then this would have happened. And boy, I sacrificed a lot. Well, let me just give you a little word about sacrifice. You only sacrifice if you have something to give. So that's a good thing. So if you sacrifice a lot, praise God. But if you're a victim of something, that's a whole different process. And I've had the privilege of working with over, just in the last year, about 400 young men from different cultures, from different backgrounds, not just Americans, but Thai kids. I want you to imagine being a 16-year-old kid brought over illegally from Burma. You come with your family. Your dad's an abusive alcoholic, beats your mom, and then just leaves you in a country that you're not of with no papers and then goes back to another country. And now you're stuck not just with your own problems, but now you're responsible to care for your mother, your grandmother, and your two children, your two sisters. What do you do? If you guys want problems, I can give you problems. And the reason I'm saying that isn't because your problem isn't real, because your problem is so real because you're in it. But what I'm saying is I watched a young man at the age of 16, year old, 16 years old with a sixth grade education and didn't know English and in four months gave himself to something that was in his heart and he showed up every week to learn how to do photography. You're thinking, photography, come on. Listen, God put things in your heart on purpose. He put things in your heart on purpose. Do you know God cares about your photography? He cares about going to see a movie with you. He cares about listening to music with you. You see, we've made God this disconnected deity that is so far away from us that even when we believe He's good and, he's, and He cares for us and we say all these things, when we go about our day, if we really ponder it and we're honest with ourselves, He's not really a part of what we're doing during the day. We just hope somehow a miracle shows up, this divine providence shows up, and there we go and there we function. Am I ringing any bells? That's how we live. And we talk about God's with us, Jesus loves you, He's in our heart. And then we step out and it's like we, we want to believe that. And I'm not speaking to anybody as if I haven't been through this. I have no fingers pointing. I could sit down and have this conversation with myself because I've had it in the mirror a few times. But this is the place that God, whatever you're at in life with your relationship with God, whatever your thoughts are, I'm not going to give you any theology. Jeff said keep my scriptures to a minimum. So no theology tonight. Because I can take you through Genesis all the way to Revelation and the whole story is about one thing. A passionate father in search of his children and doing everything in his possibility to restore that relationship. That's it. That's the Bible. It's not about a God that's sitting up playing chess with your life, negotiating, oops, didn't make a move, how are they going to respond to that? He is not a chess player. He is not a game player. He is not a trickster. He is not someone that has done things in your life to create evil. That is man's opinion 
from a wounded place in their heart that has created those things. That is not the God I serve. <clears throat> and you might say, well, you don't understand God then. I said, well, maybe I don't understand the God you're thinking about, but I understand the Father that I met. Because I remember sitting one da down one day at five years ago, and I sat in a chair and I said, God, I know a lot about you. I've been to Bible school. I went... I've, I've been, I grew up in school. My dad was an elder of a church. I, went to, I had to do the five service a night. That was, I wasn't even in recovery. <laughs> I had to be convinced I was broken for five services. I didn't know there was something good in all that. And I hated every day of it. And I just sat down and I said, God, I've, I've, I love you. I've watched you do miracles in my life. I've watched you do so many things in my life. But I've come to a place where I need you to father me. I don't want another miracle. I don't want some random thing that's going to come if I believe. I need something where my journey with you becomes the most exciting thing in my life and that's what I want. And it's amazing what happens. He brings people into your life. You see, because we need people. We need relationships and God works with relationships. And he began working friendships, and he'd been working different areas of my life. But what I discovered in that journey is I no longer had a fear about what tomorrow would bring. You know, I am so glad we get to go to heaven when we're born again. I'm so glad that Jesus provided that. I'm so glad that I'm redeemed. I'm so glad that his grace has changed me. I'm so glad I don't have to go to hell. But I will tell you something. With all of that greatness... I wouldn't trade it one day for the day I've had where God is with me today. Because the reality is that's in the future. And thank God for it. We look towards it. But I can actually walk with my Father today. How did that change? Why did that change? Because my opinion of Him changed. We were talking about coaching. I, I'm, I'm involved with mentoring. I'm involved with coaching. I coach sports teams. I've done a lot of coaching. I've done a lot of mentoring. and I've seen a lot of things. But young men, primarily who we work with, and I know it's true of girls, they just want someone to believe in them. Will you just believe in me? And one thing I love about this place, and this is one of my favorite audiences to be in, is you guys are real, so we can kind of just be that way. But I want to tell you something, is that we always talk about we need to believe in God, we need to believe in God, we need to believe in God. These are true. Anything I'm saying is not that it's not true. It's absolutely true. But we forget the other part. He believes in you. That's what empowers your life. That is the thing that when you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror and all hell is broken loose and you can see no hope in what tomorrow is, there has to be some light that comes in because God is passionately pursuing the idea. You have to know, I believe in you. You have to know that. Because something happens in our life. I remember in Thailand, we've now, um, our mentorship program has gained so much traction that the government has now officially, the Department of Probation in Thailand, let me just break this down for you. It is, Thailand itself is 97% Buddhist. So that means not Christian. Got that? <laughs> it is, from missionaries' perspective, the hardest country to work in because they're just not interested in the gospel. And for 100 years, it hasn't worked. So I asked God a very simple question. If you said the harvest was plenteous and the laborers are few and there was wages for the laborer, that means if I go do what you said to do that you would provide what I need. Right? Simple? I know a theologian will have to explain that to you, but it seems simple to me. <laughs> so if that's true, then why doesn't it work? See, these are honest questions, yes. See, these are little things that we start challenging God's opinion. Then when someone comes along that wants to help you that represents God, you don't believe them either. Because you're believing someone that doesn't really work. And so at some point, God has to translate in your mind to a good God. I don't care what theology you learned. I don't care how many Bible verses you know. 
I don't care how often you pray. What I do want you to care about when you walk away tonight, that God is passionately in love with you and he's pursuing you. You never, by the way, he never got lost, so you never found him. He found you. Amen. You didn't just show up. You think you're here. You think you're here because you decided to do something. Well, you did decide. You did decide to do something. You decided to show up here tonight. But who do you think was helping that process along? Who do you think has been walking alongside you all along? See, sometimes we look and say, God, where have you been? And he's been saying, I've been standing right next to you the whole time. Turn around. I'm right here. And he's so patient. I know sometimes when... I'm going to get onto that in a moment. Just a second. So, when, when God believes in you, I remember a young man um, just in May, the director, back to my point, so we're, we're now working in the government. The government has not only invited us in, we have now met with the Ministry of Justice, you know, the coup in Thailand? Yeah, we met with those government leaders. And they asked to try to figure out a way to bring our mentorship program through all the justice systems. So we're now officially in the Department of Probation over all of Chiang Mai, which is the second largest city in Thailand. And now we're also the official program. So everyone has to go through our program. We now got into the prison system, and there's a development side of the prison system, and they asked us to bring our program in. And do you know what? Our program now is their official program. And you know what? When new kids come into the program, they have to go through our program now to determine whether they can choose another religious group. Isn't that amazing? Now I'm saying all these great things because Jeff will attest, I'm not all that. I got more problems than you can shake a stick at. And you know what? Sometimes I don't bring it all to the table when I'm coming to eat. I'm missing a few things. But because I met my father and because of my opinion of him, it gave me a different opinion when people were speaking into my life. Because I now didn't have a distrust towards them. Because they will make mistakes. They will do it wrong. They will have sometimes wrong motives. But because God loves me, if I hear truth coming at me, I can now receive that truth because God's opinion of me is always good. And this isn't an easy journey. I'm not telling you something like, come on, wake up, bonehead, just get a hold of it. I understand the other side of this. I have all the mercy and grace, but I will tell you, if you will choose... To say, God, I have such a view of you. I watched my life. I watched my family. I watched everything around me. And what I saw that you have played a part in, or I believed you have played a part in, my opinion of you stinks. And some of you might think, well, I don't want to say nothing because I really don't, in case, I, you know, the hell thing. You know, Jeff was talking about being real. And if God is in his character and you see him in his nature and you see him becoming like his father don't you think God would rather have you be real and get in his face of your disappointment and have you come to him and say I just really don't have an interest in you don't you think he could probably do more in that situation than you faking like everything's great but you've turned your heart cold to him we've got to start being okay with being mad this is where the journey starts Right? In life we have to do this, but somehow we think that's wise in life, but when it comes to God, there's a whole different set of rules. You know, that, that is something that's not smart. That's called insanity. We have one set of rules for the God that we're of, but we have another set of rules for the people that we're here with, and we're trying to figure out all that stuff. He's not complicated. That's why He sent His own Son in, the, in human flesh to be called Jesus. And He says, I came to show you the Father. I want you to see what a father-son relationship looks like that's healthy because I haven't found one in the Bible yet. So he had to model it. So we're in good hands. So all of our mistakes is because we've never, had, we've never been shown until we've now seen Jesus. So back to the prison. I'm with this. I get a call and I, I guess we officially became the liaison. So when a foreigner gets put in prison now, we become the liaisons to go help the district attorney deal with them. I have no idea how we got picked for that. And I wasn't asked. I was just told to get in the limousine and we're going. <laughs> so the director takes me to rehab center. There's a young man in there. His name, his name is Max. He's from Germany. 
and he's married to a Thai wife 10 years, and he was trying to throw his kids off the balcony in a mall. I go in, he has scars up and down his arms, across his neck, where he's trying to kill himself to get out of the rehab and get over into the psych, uh, psychiatric ward. And that was just because they had better drugs there. The staff was afraid of him. I know a little Thai in language, but I also know a lot of little Thais. They're just not real big people. <laughs> and when you have this big, tall German that's going crazy, they're like, you've got to get him out of here. And so they were doing everything, but the laws were kind of stuck at the moment because you couldn't deport him because he's married to a Thai person, so they didn't know how to deal with this situation, so he was stuck in limbo. But I met a director who has such a heart and love for people, and you could tell his heart is open to the gospel in such a tangible way, but he says, you have to go. You're going to go deal with them and you're going to go fix a problem. I said, okay. Which means God is doing something. So I get about, we go up there, we interview all the staff, and we're sitting there, and I'm praying about what do I say to this person, because everyone has something that will unlock your heart. And if you will listen long enough, and you will let God go to that place that you put the barrier up in your heart, it will open. It will open. And if you let that happen, you will find something transpire in your life that will knock your socks off. His solution to your problem is so simple, that's why it gets complicated. Now, I'm not saying it's easy. I just said it's simple. There's a big difference, right? Now, why is a man having to go deal with the problem? Why isn't God just coming to shine his face on that person? Everyone is in here because of a person. Is that correct? Did anybody hear a voice from God and you just got in a car and drove down the street? It happens. I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just wondering how many is here because a person invited them or you trusted the words of another person to come. So look around. Keep your hands up for a moment. This is important. Look around. Why? Because that person loved you to tell you and knew this would be a benefit to you because they came through it and what they experienced. Do you see how people are involved in this process? That's God. That doesn't make God mystical and it's kind of flowing and it's this imaginary fantasy. That means the father loved a person and they couldn't help but let that love come out on someone else. But the person they told had to believe the words. They had to be coached to come to group. Coaching. Catching this? So we sit down. I said, God, you have a word for this person. I'm convinced God speaks through us, to us, and all about us, because I think he's always talking. I think we're, I'll tell you why we don't hear, and it's a whole different reason why you think you don't. But I'm, God's always talking to us. I said, God, what do you want to say to this man? I have no idea what to tell him, because I have no idea his background. All I know is our responsibility to fix the problem. That's all I was told. Because my mentor is the director when I'm under his authority. So if the director under his authority says, I want you to go and fix the problem, then I just have to go fix the problem. See, you're always under something. Now, that's not mean I didn't have to go out from God because God was setting me up, but I'm still under someone submitting to the process. So I'm submitting to the director of Thailand. He's sending me in. I go sit down and I get 15 minutes with the guy privately and I say to him, he starts telling me all the reasons why he's in the problem. I get it. I've been there. But you know, after a while, you kind of... Are, are we done? <laughs> Not out of... Because we don't... we just all been there. And we, we listened for a while, but after the, about the fifth round, it's like, okay. I get it, but can, let's just transfer over here. Let's just have a new thought today. Right? I love you guys, so just can I... Can I just put it out like that? Okay, so. So anyway, so I sit down with him and I just, he finally is talking and I finally just say, Max, how long are you going to keep running from him? I just want to know how long you're going to keep running from him. And then I'm saying, God, did I just say the right thing? That's really stupid what I just said. And he stopped and put his head down. He goes, a long time. He didn't know about Jesus Christ. He, he grew up in Germany. He has some theological background. But he knew markedly that God was after his heart. 
So I explained who Jesus was. I explained what he did. And I said, Jesus came so you would understand what a father-son relationship looks like. And you know why he cleans you up? He doesn't clean you up because he can't stand looking at you because you're such a filthy thing. And if he can get you cleaned up, at least he can open his eyes to you. He cleaned you up so he could live in you. His passion was to get inside of you forever. And if you just open the door, if you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. I'm just telling you. If you just give him an inch, just crack the door open. He's going he's gonna to abu- he's gonna abuse the privilege. He's going to come all the way through. We got 15 minutes. They interrupted, say we got to go. We finished with the panel, working with a the therapist. What should we should do? And I did tell him this one thing. I said, I want you to mark something in your mind. I want this to become so crystal clear at this moment that an entire government changed their policy today for you. A nation has done something different that they have never done before on behalf of you. That means there's something significantly special about you. And God has done this. I don't even know how I got here. I am sitting here on the order of the government to sit and tell you about Jesus. That's what I'm here for. So he walks away, and on his way out he says, Can I have a Bible? And I said, Sure, I'll I'll ask the director and we'll work that out. You know, because even though I work in a government, we can say we can smuggle Bibles in and all that stuff. You know, sometimes you just need to trust God and do it the right way, and you find out they'll give you more favor than trying to sneak things around. Because I did on the way back, I said, do you mind if I bring an English book into him? And God spoke to me. He goes, he doesn't want no English book. <laughs> he wants a Bible. So I finally go, can I bring a Bible in? You know, because you're still trying to walk through this process because we're still kind of human and God is a very humorous person. <laughs> and so he goes, absolutely. The next day, we're out, I'm down at the Department of Probation working on a project with some of the guys and he comes around the corner and he says, you got to come with me. We are going to go back up there. We, did you bring your Bible? And I said, well, I didn't bring it today because I didn't know we we're going today. He goes, well, we got to get it. He is so radically changed. The staff does not want anything to stop. We got to get the Bible. We got to get everything to lock him into this thing. <laughs> Amen. So we did. That was three months ago. He is doing awesome. They, they can't even believe the therapist is kind of mad. She's trying to figure out how is this all working? How did this all go? How, how do we make all this happen? And God showed up. And here's what the director said. He goes, the only part of the Bible I've read was the Moses thing. And that was just because the movie came out. So he was kind of interested. So he read about Moses. And he said, you know, Buddhists are very interesting. We, we, don't, we, don't, we need to have things that are real. They have to be real. And I used to think what that meant was I got to touch Jesus' side. I got to see the glory cloud come down. I got to phys- That's not what that means. What it means is if you say God is real, I want to see in your life God doing something that's different that God, only God can do. Then I will believe it's real. So he said, Brian, you're Moses. I said, how am I Moses? He said, God told you to do something you couldn't do. You went and did it and God showed up. You're Moses. Now, I'm just saying all this because this didn't happen without a coach. I didn't do all this randomly on my own. I trusted my father. Therefore, I could trust other people that were in my authority, that I was under their authority in these areas. And because I trusted my father, I began to trust them and didn't think, oh, they're Buddhists. They're probably going to try to trick this whole thing up. And God, you're going to get slandered in this, so I'm going to do it my own way. I didn't. I didn't have to do that. If God could bring me there, I think he could manage keeping me in the journey, right? And so they're the ones that are actually pushing and promoting the issue of the fatherless in their community. We've been working with the princess. We've been working with the, the Bangkok go- government. They're so fascinating. We had to go do a project to talk about how to stop drugs in a community. And they said this, we can't create more laws because it doesn't do anything. This is their, go- this is their government. We've got to restore the family and we've got to put the Father back in it. Amen. Amen. So this brings us back to our closing point. But what if it's still an F word to me? What if that sounds great and I hear all that, that's wonderful, but at the end of the day I'm still going to walk away going, it really sucks. It really is not a fun experience for me. 
And that's where I want for you to understand, and, and a lot of times we take that in, and there, therefore when you're being coached by people you trust, see a lot of you came in and were willing to do anything when you first got in knowing you wanted out of what you were, but then when you're trying to get transitioned into what you're to become, that's when we start doing the disconnect a little bit. See, that's how slaves think. See, a slave will come in from this end and they cry out to get deliverance from the thing that they're in. But they don't really understand what they're trying to get to, so everything in the journey is bad. Children of Israel cry out after 400 years of slavery, okay? They finally cry out. They are delivered. Three days later, where's the water? Where's the food? Where, we laugh about that. You know what? It's because they've lived a life being trained as an animal. Reward, discipline, reward, discipline, reward, discipline. So if anybody's saying anything, I'll do it if I get the reward. I'll do it if I, so I don't get disciplined. I'll do it if I get a reward. I'll do it so I don't get disciplined. And we've done that with God because that's why I say, well, if you do this, you won't go to heaven. If you do this, you're going to go to hell. If you do this, you won't go to heaven. And we're just trying not to do those things. Then life stinks. And we're just trying to escape. Give me Candy Crush for 40 years so I can be done. Right? We just want to escape it. But if all of a sudden you realize God never was written writing to slaves. He never wrote a book to a slave. He never wrote a letter to a slave. He wrote letters to sons and daughters. The reason we can't hear his voice, the reason we struggle when a coach comes along and wants to draw something out, even when the coach says, Man, pull the slack out. you got to get up. I see more in you. He's not talking to your behavior. He's seeing the greatness in you and he's saying, I'm tired of the old mess holding you back. I want you. But if we, don't, if we think we're a slave, we think he's attacking our personality, that he's attacking our person, that he's, that he's shaming who we are. But a good coach does not see your behavior as your identity. A good coach sees what you are and draws out of you and will do everything to keep that from holding back who your identity is. But if we can understand God's opinion of us, that we are deeply cherished, like picture in the wallet type love, like shows, like if he had a Facebook page, he'd be up there, you know, showing, and this is my kid, and this is when they're being dumb, and I still love them, right? If we would understand that relationship that he deeply wants with us, that he modeled in Jesus, we would understand how he talks to us. So he talks to who you really are. He talks to your identity. He talks to the woman of God. He talks to the man of God. He talks to your strength. He talks to the person that he believes in. And he talks to that person. And we're so connected to our broken slavery, we don't know who he's talking to, so we ignore the words. Something good happened. Oh, that can't be from God. He loves me. Well, he doesn't know what I did. And we'll spend 10 minutes convincing him how wrong he is. See, that everybody gets caught up in what pride is. Pride is not you thinking you're all that in the sense of look at me, look at me, look at me. Pride is saying that your opinion is better than his. The moment you say, God, you can't think that good of me, that's pride. In Acts it says the reason that the Jews could not accept Jesus was because they deemed themselves unworthy of eternal life. Jesus never pushed someone away. God never pushed someone away. Our opinions of ourselves pushed us away. That's what he came to redeem. He came to redeem the opinion he has of you. And it's from this point when you can let that settle in, all of a sudden now the coaches around you and the people around you have a different view because their opinion of us is good. So now there's times when I love my kids, but there's times after I picked up that shoe in the aisle 17 times after I said, go get it, and it's still sitting there. I'm not going to go up to him and say, David, um, I've asked you 17 times to go pick up that shoe, but I don't want to offend you. 
No, it's David. And pretty soon, I don't say another word. The shoe's picked up and it's off into the closet. But he knows I love him. You see, love has both pieces because I refuse to let something dumb stop the greatness that's in them. Now, I can't change them by making them do it, but I'm going to speak the truth at who they are. But they know that I love them. And when that is settled, when that opinion of me towards my kids, even coaching soccer, there's times I can go out and chew their heads off for what they just did. But because for four years they know my heart towards them, we had a young man that I had to pull a captain's badge senior year. Mom was not happy. Halfway through the season, senior year, you're getting ready, you're one of the top players on the team, you're about ready to make top scorer, and you get your badge pulled. Why did we pull the badge? Because he thought the world revolved around him. And I have seen enough kids tank it right after this point that I refuse to let him go down that journey. So whether he liked me again or not, I pulled the badge. But his response, his mom still doesn't talk to me, but his response <laughs> to this process, I got a letter because he asked me to write a letter to get into the university. He's a top student. He's like a straight-A student, engineering student, everything credentials. But he had to have something from a coach to get the scholarship. So I wrote the letter and I said, we had an issue. We dealt with it. And his response to being corrected was so phenomenal that the section gave him all conference. He, the team picked him as MVP. And he ended up being top scorer because of the change. And he said, Coach, thank you for what you did because today I got a full ride to the university. <laughs> Amen. Because he knew my opinion of him that I would go to the nth of the earth to help him. And I was not afraid to tell him the truth. So here's what I'm leaving you with. The Father God can't always fix your natural relationships. He can't always fix what happened in the past with your father. But he's not looking for you to model your natural father. He's looking you for you to model Jesus as a picture of what a father looks like because his name means everlasting father. And he wants you to see him from a different light that this is how my father treats me. This is how my Father sees me. The same way God sees Jesus, according to John 17, is the exact same way Jesus and God see you. That's what He came to give, restore back. And when you start letting God's opinion of you settle, and when you wake up and you're feeling down, and you're feeling lowly, and you're feeling all these things, let's be honest, the only time we ever really want to escape is when we're feeling down. Right? When we're feeling up, we don't want to escape anything. We want to enjoy the moment. So if all of a sudden an opinion, I mean, come on, you guys have looked at a Facebook post and it tore your heart out and then you looked at another one and it made you uplifted, right? I mean, we shouldn't be getting in our identity from all that, but anyway. <clears throat> you know how it is. When you're feeling down, it's like it's hard to unpack that. Like something sets in motion a direction. And God wants you to stop and look in the mirror and start telling yourself what he says about you. So let me tell you what he says about you. And Jeff, you're going to come up, because I'm just going to keep on going if I don't. <laughs> Galatians 4, 5 through 7 says this. He came to redeem those who were under the law or slaves. That's a position. Quit looking at behavior. He came to redeem a position that we might receive adoption as sons. And it's not referring to a gender, ladies. It's referring to a position. And because you are the sons... God sent forth His Spirit of His Son into your heart, crying, Abba, Father, which means relationship. New picture. New view. That's what He came to give you. And when you will let those words sit in, when you're feeling down and you start telling your circumstances, wait a second, this is God's opinion of me. This is God's... You take 15 minutes and walk around the bathroom shouting at yourself in the mirror, you'll start feeling pretty good just a moment. But then also, when you have a problem, then you also be comfortable to go to someone for help because your identity is not stripped. If I go tell them, then all the shame is going to come on me and I don't want to expose and I don't start retreating when a problem happens. No, you march right, march right in and say, Jeff, man, I screwed this up. I've had to call him on the phone and say, I got a problem. 
And I told him before, I like helping him with his problems more than I like dealing with my own. But he was the first one to sit and say, okay, let's walk through it. Maybe you need to do this. Maybe you need to take care of this. Okay. I need outside eyes, but because of my confidence in God, I can go to someone and let them speak into my life and make decisions. That's Father. And God wants to restore that. Amen? Amen. Okay. You know, to me, it's a real blessing when you, 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 you don't have, you know, I consider Brian a brother of mine in, in the kingdom. And, um, you know, he's been away with him and his family over in Thailand and God is doing miraculous things. And, you know, this coming February, you know, they're looking at setting up some Serenity Village homes over in Thailand. And it's just amazing. It's truly amazing. And God connects the dots. But I, I want to just close with this. Um, you know, and truly... God has elevated you. You've always had the anointing and you've always had the knowledge. But since I've seen you last, God has truly elevated you, Brian. And, and it's, a, it's a privilege to watch. And, and, and God says, be fruitful and multiply. And he's clearly doing that in your heart and your family's lives. And to me, I mean, God is just getting started, you know, what he's going to be doing in and through us. But after 11 years of Serenity Village, um, I would tell you the, the number one contributing factor between a person staying a slave in bondage of addiction and a person getting free is the person can't be coached. I'm sitting here because of co my coach, my natural father, who's Dave Hill in the back, and my spiritual father, Bishop Earl, and brothers like Brian that, that do that. It's all about your ability to be coached. And one of the number one things that I see in men and women's lives, I'm talking thousands that have been in and out of this program and in these rooms with us over the last 11 years, is they are looking for something wrong with the coach because they felt there was something wrong with their earthly father. And in the same breath, they're looking, what's wrong with God? And you just heard it, which is all biblical, from Brian himself that God is not disappointed in you. If we point out something, God uses people just like Brian used the analogy of Moses and that gentleman called him Moses. That's not about ego. That's not about nothing but God uses people. And my prayer for you on my birthday is that you can be coached. And the person that God is selecting to coach you is probably not the person that you would select. <laughs> when they tell you, go find a sponsor you can relate to in AA, you're going to go find the most weakest, <laughs> soft-spoken person in the room. You need somebody that's hardcore, that loves you enough to tell you the truth. See, in Hebrews 12, God says that He disciplines those He loves. So when I'm working with men or women, and, and what I see is they don't, they don't like to be corrected. I mean, what benefit does, you know, I can speak for myself, do I have to spend my time to correct you? There's no benefit to me. The benefit is for you. Five years ago, I made a decision, and this is, you know, in six years into Serenity Village, that I'm going to let somebody correct me. That I'm going to let somebody father me from a spiritual and recovery perspective. And because of that, my relationship, that, which has always been good with my earthly dad, is phenomenal. He's one of my best friends. You have to be coached. Just like Brian said, you all come in here, and, and I'm one of you. When I say you all, I'm speaking about me too. Any significant athlete, er, worldly leader, CEO, C, COO, pastor, bishop, had a coach. Each and every one of them had a coach. I know in the day of internet you think you can teach yourself. That's not true. There is no anointing through the internet. I mean, Bishop Jakes is the closest thing that I've seen to it. And trust me, and, and I want you to make a commitment to yourself, first and foremost. Can you be coached? God uses people. 
And if you study anybody of significance, there's a difference between significance and success. I've had su success and I wasn't significant. If you want to be a significant player in the kingdom of God and in, in the recovery world, you have to be coached. If you ask Will Kleiber, who's sitting there, he is coached. I would say 80% of you, probably 90, will not allow yourself to be coached. It is too bad. And I don't say that to belittle you. I don't say that to disrespect you. I say that because I love you and you need a coach. <laughs> and a coach is not just someone you hear on Sundays or Tuesdays. A coach is somebody you take 100% direction from, you take, you know, you study them, and, and a coach knows better than the student. A teacher knows better than the student, but a lot of us think that we know it all. I didn't get here because I knew it all. But what has made a difference in my life in the last five years is I'm able to be coached. You deserve to be coached. That's why God brought you here. This is not a normal program. He's not a normal missionary. These pastors in the front row are not pastors that just pastor on Sunday. They pastor 24-7. Coaching. You have to be coached. And let me tell you something. The 90% of all relationships that I have had with men in 11 years in this program have failed because of the resentment they have towards their earthly father. And because of the resentment they have towards their earthly father, men and women, they have the same resentment to God the Father. So anybody that comes in the role of a coach or a spiritual father will never be successful because anybody of authority over them, and not because the coach isn't successful. Look around you. I'd say that with all humility. You go to a Super Bowl game, the coach is successful. Look at the fruit. The individuals are not successful because they're easily offended and they think the coach is telling them they're a failure just because they failed. Just because you failed at something doesn't make you a failure. Just because you made a mistake in your process doesn't mean that you are a mistake. Like Brian said, we're not talking about the person. We're talking about the position. You have to reposition yourself to be trainable, teachable, coachable, and humble. And the reason why we can't do that in recovery is because somebody that was in that position early on failed us. So now anybody that's ever going to be in the position of coach, mentor, pastor will fail us. Quite frankly, even if they're not failing us, we're going to make something up in our heads that they are failing us. And the only one that fails then is not the coach, is the person. You deserve better than that. Quit thinking everybody's like everybody else. As a pastor, I'm not your father. I'm your coach. I don't think I should be the coach. I'm a crack addict. But it ain't about what I think. Maybe, you know, if you, if, just like Brian said, I mean, you can find a hundred things that are wrong with me if you look for them. I'll even tell you about some of them. Because <laughs> I know who I am. That's a true coach. Someone that you can relate to. So find a coach. Find a coach. See, I couldn't get connected to God the Father until I got connected to Bishop Earl. Because I didn't know what it was like to get connected. You know, you look at my three children up here tonight. I mean, one of them just did four weeks at Bible camp. He texts me today and says, Dad, God has got amazing things in plan for you. My 18-year-old turned. I never forced spirituality and religion on her. She's got a heart of gold, heart of gold. Last week for her 18th birthday, she can, I'll buy her anything she wants, and I'm able to. She wanted a Bible. 
My 22-year-old just said, you know what? Blood don't make anybody a father. Coach, your past does not need to dictate your future. This is a new day in a new season. The rest of your life can and will be the best of your life. It comes down to, can you? God obviously thinks something of you. He put you on this championship team. This is no joke. So I love you. I, I couldn't think of a better place for me to be on my birthday than with you. You make me a better person. See, it's not just about the coach and the player. The players make the coach a better coach. Teachable, trainable, coachable. And where everybody fails is when the coach gets the player. You've seen it in professional sports. The coach gets the star athlete to get a MVP, and then it's all about the player. Any MVP that references his coach will stay an MVP. We've seen even Minnesota Vikings, Timberwolves, All-Stars, couldn't be coached. They ain't playing no more. Quite frankly, all the millions of dollars they made is, are gone. Can you be coached? Being coached means being loved. I love you. God bless you. Thank you.